Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Jyoti Mathur Philip, and I am the director for the uh, for the implementation support division, and leading the work on the post 2020 global biodiversity framework in um, at the secretariat. Uh, on behalf of the CBD Secretariat, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for this webinar, especially on this really, really uh, important day. Oh, on the I am very. Uh, I, I think we should um, mute everyone, Terry, if that's possible. Thanks. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you to this event today a celebration of International Women's Day. The theme for this year's International Day, Gender Equality Today for a Sustainable Tomorrow, is particularly relevant for the global biodiversity agenda, as all of you know from participating in our meetings over the last two years. The theme explicitly recognizes the contribution of women and girls around the world who are actively working to advance action on the environment, on climate change adaptation, mitigation and response, and disaster risk reduction. This is a very timely moment to put a spotlight on the role of women and girls in environmental action as we move forward into 2022 with a full calendar of key meetings, negotiations and events um, for advancing the global biodiversity framework in line with ongoing efforts for advancing gender equality and sustainable development. As you may know, next Monday, March 14th, marks the start of the resumed set of meetings of the CBD subsidiary bodies and the open-ended working group on post-2020 on the pro uh, or, or, or to develop the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, during which the draft post-2020 gender plan of action will be discussed, as well as considerations for addressing gender equality in the context of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The CBD has long put a focus on addressing the links between gender and biodiversity, Recognizing that women around the world should not be considered solely as vulnerable actors in the context of biodiversity loss and environmental degradation, but acknowledged and supported in their roles as agents of change, leaders and key partners. Look at the panel today. So I hope that we get inspiration from it. This perspective is critical in ensuring a truly inclusive and participatory approach to tackling the direct and indirect drivers of biodiversity loss and in keeping with the 2020 Agenda for Sustainable Development, ensuring that no one is left behind. We can see in the CBD processes an increasing level of interest and engagement on issues of gender, and social inclusion, which, as evidence in the best practices publication to be launched today, is taking shape in different forms of action on the ground. We will have a chance to hear about some of these best practices today, and I am pleased to welcome colleagues from Mexico and Uganda to share their experiences with us. I also have the great pleasure first to invite my dear colleague and chair of the subsidiary body on implementation, uh, Charlotte Sörqvist from, from the Ministry of Environment in Sweden uh, to give some opening remarks on behalf of the government of Sweden, whose generous funding support has enabled the CBD secretariat to put together this publication. My thanks again to Sweden for their very welcome support and to all of you for joining us today. Charlotte, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jyoti. And uh, dear colleagues, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all today on behalf of the government of Sweden to launch the new CBD publication of best practices in gender and biodiversity pathways for multiple benefits. Sweden recognized the critical importance of gender equality 
in the context of efforts, concern, and sustainable use of biodiversity, and the relevance of gender responsive measures to ensure effective implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. The occasion of International Women's Days gives an opportunity to bring attention to the need for and value of such efforts being carried out throughout the year. The Best Practices publication provides a compilation of detailed case studies and short examples from around the world that demonstrate how addressing gender considerations can take different forms and yield valuable benefits of biodiversity and other environmental and development concerns, including in a pursuit of peace and tackling zoonosis. These examples are informative and inspiring and offer guidance for how we may reach out our shared objectives for gender equality and biodiversity in ways that are mutually supportive and contribute to long lasting gains. Altogether, this collection of case studies and short snapshots makes an important contribution to strengthening the evidence base on gender responsive biodiversity policy and action. I invite you to take the time to review the publication, to learn about efforts undertaken in your region and around the world. It is our hope that the examples shared in this publication will help to inspire and encourage other innovative efforts and enable opportunities to build on these learning and lessons as the international community works to achieve a new set of goals and targets of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Together, we can help to ensure that we make the most of opportunities before us to ensure a gender responsive approach to implementation and better outcomes for all. I will now invite Tanya McGregor, the Gender Program Officer from the CBD Secretariat to provide an overview of the publication. And finally, I wish you all a very happy International Women's Day. Tanya, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Char Charlotta and Jyoti. And my thanks to all of you for joining us today. It's great to see so many of you have taken the time to be here. And I apologize if there's been some distraction with uh, admitting people into the meeting. Uh, we're trying out a, a different platform for this, and I think there's some, some glitches. So I apologize for that. Um, but I would like to start the session with a short introduction to the best practices document, including some of the key findings and messages, following which I will hand things over to my esteemed colleagues who are are joining us today. Uh, we have Andrea Cruz, who is the coordinator of biodiversity strategies and in international cooperation with the National Commission for Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity, Canabio, Mexico, who will speak about Mexico's experience in gender responsive development of and reporting on their national biodiversity strategy and action plan and um, related innovative programming. Um, Peter Achu, who is here today, who is a project manager with the Global Environment Facility, UNDP, in Ghana, or in Uganda, and will speak about U Uganda's efforts to coordinate gender actions under different agencies to deliver on commitments across the Rio Conventions and the SDGs. And we will take questions after the presentation, so feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will come back to them at that time. So I'll just begin with uh, speaking about a bit about the purpose and the approach of the publication. Uh, if we could just move to the next slide. Thanks. So the purpose of the um, the publication, we, we recognize that there is there is a bit of a gap in terms of information or detailed um, studies and and uh, a description of outcomes um, related to strengthening or related to both gender uh, equality and biodiversity uh, objectives. So the publication is intended to strengthen and update the evidence base on gender responsive biodiversity policy and action, and as well in doing so to support parties, indigenous peoples and local communities and stakeholders to integrate gender considerations 
in the implementation of the post 2020 global biodiversity framework. And this publication is in so doing and in, in showcasing different examples from around the world. This is intended to also serve as a justification as to why it's valuable, why it's worth investing in, in gender responsive approaches for biodiversity. So the, the approach that we took to develop the publication was the CBD Secretariat launched a call for contributions on recent and ongoing um, initiatives, gender and biodiversity initiatives. The focus was on innovative, transformative actions that demonstrate action at scale and were based on positive examples from 2015 onwards. So we wanted to make sure we had recent examples. And in parallel, additional research was undertaken to identify potential case studies meeting, meeting the criteria established and covering different geographies and types of best practice. So the publication contains a total of 10 detailed case studies from regions around the world um, covering gender responsive biodiversity policy and practices in different sectors and contexts. And the detailed case studies are complemented by 27 best practice snapshots or short case examples, which draw on the many submissions that we received in the call. So I'll, I'll just speak now about the criteria that were used for establishing uh, the best practices. So we were looking for best practice uh, or initiatives that met at least one or more of the criteria uh, before you on this screen. So these included um, uh, initiatives that had impacts for biodiversity, as well as for gender equality and women's empowerment. Initiatives intended to inform uh, gender relations or um, address the root causes of gender inequality through addressing biodiversity concerns. Um, those that uh, supported implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. And you'll see in the publication, there are two tables in the, in the start of the publication. Um, one summarizes and gives some examples of how the best practices are supporting implementation of SDG 5 or the, the SDG to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment. And the second table gives some best examples of best practices supporting the implementation of other SDGs. So we are, we are also in this process looking for synergies with actions under the Rio conventions, um, looking to identify innovative technologies and approaches, including the application of traditional and new approaches, and um, also looking for financing from new or non-standard partners, uh, such as private sector, public-private partnerships, the Green Climate Fund, and others. And lastly, we are looking for initiatives undertaken at larger scales, so scales beyond the level of a, uh, of a few communities, but looking at those that have an impact at national or regional scales. So I'll just move on to speak about some of the key findings from the the um, that are listed in the publication. So some of what emerged in in uh, this review of best practices was was a, a kind of three main action areas and these uh, you may recognize are, are somewhat reflected in the draft gender plan of action that is going to be discussed in the upcoming CBD meetings in Geneva. Uh, the first action area that is is uh, prominent among the case studies that we looked at uh, is equal ensuring equal access to land and biological resources. So two of the main strategies identified to support this included um, tackling legal policy and social barriers and promoting women's equal and effective participation in user groups, such as uh, for forests and water. In one case study, uh, access to land was, was a key first step, uh, which allowed other measures um, to be undertaken to give women as well as men access to natural to other natural resources. Um, secondly, equitable benefits uh, related to biodiversity conservation and sustainable use. Uh, we um, we identified best practices related to creating sustainable income generation and employment opportunities as well as women's collective act uh, women's collective action to improve their benefits from biological resources. 
So a number of case studies showcased income generation action, actions related to ecosystem services, including highlighting how supporting women to brave gender stereotypes can be an important step in helping them to enter paid employment in non-traditional areas. And supporting women's collective action to improve their benefits can include things such as formalizing women's informal groups. So one case study, for example, involved the creation of a women's association to strengthen women's bargaining power and advocate for their interests and rights. And thirdly, um, a lot of uh, best practices refer to equal voice or supporting equal voice in decision making for biodiversity at all levels. So and when we're looking at decision making, this is talking about increasing not just the numbers of women participating, but also the quality of women's participation. Um, equal access to decision making has the additional benefit of incentivizing women and men to contribute their unique knowledge and capacities to promote biodiversity outcomes. So a couple of things at the national level that are, are relevant include engaging, um, ensuring women are engaged meaningfully at all stages of um, development and preparation and implementation of national biodiversities and strategies and action plans, as well as sector policy processes. And um, also making concrete provisions to uh, address gender inequalities and build on women's potential in legal provisions and policies and programs. So I'll just move on to speak about some of the other key findings um, now. There uh, also emerged from the case study review or the best practice review, uh, a number of implementation mechanisms. Uh, there's five that are listed here, which include capacity development, strengthening the evidence base, gender responsive um, biodiversity finance, good data development and use, and gender action of plans and resources. Now, I won't go into all of these now. Some of these are reflected also in the um, key messages that I'll, I'll come to next, but I just wanted to highlight that the publication also includes um, two annexes. The first presents some examples of uh, recent tools and toolkits, which can be considered best practices related to capacity development because they tackle specific strategic issues um, rather than offer general guidance. And the second annex sets out some recent research and knowledge products that may be useful for, for parties and for stakeholders in addressing specific issues in gender and biodiversity. So on to the key messages for the um, that came out of this publication and and I want to um, highlight as well that these are these are intended for communication, but also to encourage and support and and guide um, parties and, and other stakeholders to to really look for ways to implement these kinds of practices in efforts to implement the um, post 2020 global biodiversity framework and the CBD gender plan of action. So these include tackling the tough stuff, um, recognizing that um, changing stereotypes, it, gender stereotypes is needed um, uh, because these can often get in the way of, of uh, achieving gender and biodiversity outcomes. Uh, we can see now a growing recognition that things like community-based and participatory approaches are not always or not necessarily gender responsive. And um, this is stimulating active efforts to truly engage all members of the community and ensure that no one is left behind. Um, an innovative strategy uh, related to this is to tackle gender issues, not just at the community level, but also in the home. So this involves making visible um, women's unpaid household contributions with regard to natural resource management to help illustrate the critical role they, they play in, in managing biodiversity and uh, natural resources. Um, ensuring equitable access to land and natural resources is important for multiple gains. Um, uh, closing gender gaps and access to land and natural resources is a fundamental building block uh, effectively for transformative change for both biodiversity and for gender equality. 
although this may be a challenging exercise um, to in, ensure or improve secure access to land and resources, um, some of the best practices in the document include um, encouraging efforts such as joint land titling, ensuring equal participation in user groups, and formalizing women's informal collectives. And action in this area can support um, efforts to achieve uh, multiple SDG targets. I also want to highlight um, the, the need for promotion of women's collective action and organizations and networks. Uh, many best practices support women's organizations and networks, uh, creating spaces for women to build knowledge of their rights with regard to biodiversity, as well as how they can contribute to conserving biodiversity. These organizations and networks can provide a forum for women to develop technical skills, increase opportunities for sustainable livelihoods, and allow women to connect with each other and with other stakeholders. Um, these uh, women's organizations and networks may also foster and encourage women to aim for leadership roles. And on the subject of, of fostering women's leadership, um, strategies to do so include things such as engaging with women as well as with men in biodiversity related policy and programming processes, um, which may include um, processes related to the development, revision and implementation of national biodiversity strategies and action plans and um, project formulation, as well as reporting and um, measures to increase women's effective participation and leadership roles in biodiversity related governance bodies are also important and are being undertaken by different actors. So I'll just move on to the, the last set of key messages that are contained in the document. So these in include um, creating and tapping into gender responsive financing opportunities. Uh, funding is needed, as we know, to undertake uh, gender responsive biodiversity actions, and this funding needs to really reach women and men on the ground. Um, there are some promising examples from climate and environmental financing mechanisms with gender related commitments that appear to be um, stimulating greater uptake of gender considerations and the biodiversity actions they finance. And these can provide a, an important entry point for stakeholders and offer linkages between global and and uh, regional programs. And innovative uh, approaches along these lines include things like uh, applying women's participation as a criterion for receiving and deciding on use of community funds. Other stat strategies include allocation of funds to deliver on gender actions in national biodiversity strategies and action plans. Um, also, use using and producing good data. And we all know that good data is essential to inform biodiversity, effective biodiversity policy and programming and its implementation. Uh, best practices in the report include making visible in official statistics, women's often unpaid roles in biodiversity management, and things such as uh, informational surveys that target women as well as men and include gender-related questions are also key to shaping gender-responsive interventions that are relevant to specific contexts. Uh, building partnerships between those designing new projects and initiatives and organizations with gender expertise, um, including women's networks and others, are also identified as best practices to produce and apply gender and biodiversity data. And lastly, I just want to highlight the importance of scaling up this the small scale. Um, so smaller scale uh, initiatives and pilots potentially offer rich ideas and models for scale up. New and larger biodiversity initiatives can build on these um, these uh, examples and approaches wherever possible to make the most of existing investments, learning and capacities. And and one means to do so is to first uh, find out what relevant and successful actions are um, have been undertaken, and this can be done through stakeholder consultations and gender analysis to identify these uh, successful models and ideas. So with that, I'll just move to the next um, almost last slide. Thank you. So um, just to highlight again, 
that uh, we are we are very fortunate to have received so many uh, useful and really valuable and interesting uh, case studies uh, and different examples in in the call and uh, and also through the research that we identified. Um, ten of these are are um, outlined in detail in the publication, and then there are twenty seven snapshots that really give a range and um, a good uh, reflection of the different types of, of interesting and really inspirational initiatives happening around the world. So I encourage you to take a look at these and I'll just move to the next slide where you can see the link to find the publication. If you haven't had a chance to uh, look at it already, I invite you to do so. It's available on the CBD uh, web page. So with that, I thank you very much. As mentioned before, we'll take any questions um, at the end of the presentations. And without further ado, I would like to move uh, forward now to invite my colleague um, Andrea Cruz from Canabio in Mexico to, to speak about Mexico's experience related to M their MBSAP and their work. And I would also just just quickly before before inviting Andrea to speak, I would I would just also note that um, both Andrea and Peter were invited to consider their interventions related to some guiding questions. And these were uh, specifically what have been the key elements of success of your initiative and with regards to the post 2020 global biodiversity framework and a gender responsive approach to implementation. What lessons would you share for from your experience? So with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Andrea, and thank you so much. Hello, um, Tanya, and good uh, good morning to all. And I'm very glad to to be here with you today. Uh, well, first, I think that for for the Mexican Mexican initiative, I would say that we were very fortunate to have that there was an international organization like IUCN that offer us the opportunity to conduct this exercise of mainstreaming gender in the Mexican NBSAP. Um, it was a very tough uh, decision because we already have almost finished the, the update of the NBSAP and, and it was not a good news for me when I received the offer of IUCN telling me you have to review all your NBSAP again, but I think I made the right call and I'm so glad I did it because I we were um, able to learn from the most experienced people in, in IUCN and in, in Mexico um, what was this topic about. I didn't have the experience I have now and I think that once you <clears throat> sorry, you learn from this topic, it just stays with you because it's gender equality is a topic of basic humanity. If we want to advance us as, a, as human beings, we have to recognize that this is a topic that has to be uh, uh, taken care of. Second, I think that it was the right time also for because of the inside of the Mexican government we have a lot of capacities and institutions that recognize that there is a historical debt to women and girls, especially indigenous women and girls in rural environments that include access to land or natural resources, but also includes education and health. And uh, I think that the country, uh, my country, Mexico, recognizes that the only way to achieve a more participatory and equal society would be to tackle the gender quality, gender gaps and, and inequalities. Of course, biodiversity has always been in close to Mexican women, in particular in rural environments, and we have uh, and, and they have very uh, important role as caretakers and agents of change for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. And this has been recognized by uh, many institutions and peoples, and we have, I think, been developing these capacities in order to uh, 
been able to to be very vocal on on this. Um, so I, I would say that uh, this was um, a, a very fortunate event when all the planets were aligned because we had the, the funding, the intervention of, of a, uh, an institution or an international organization that did have the, the, the know-how on, on how to do this. And um, the moment was just right for, for Mexico. And then for the second question on what ex lessons learned, uh, I would share for the post-2020, um, I would say that all countries should try to uh, make this gender mainstreaming in the MBSAP. The MBSAPs take a completely different focus if you put the gender in the center of, of, of these issues. And also, I think we still have a lot of um, probably barriers and issues and we still have to be better and at documenting, you know, with gender disaggregated data in order to show how important the participation of women and girls are in, um, in the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. But I think that we are making a lot of progress and, and I'm very glad that we will have an updated um, gender plan of action for the post 2020 to go along with this uh, framework and and that we will be able to to conduct more activities and to uh, make very visible the contribution of that women and girls make to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and i think i will stop here thank you very much thanks so much um andrea that was uh really um, uh, helpful and and um, also very efficient use of time. So, so thank you for, for that. Um, I will um, now hand things over to Peter Achu, who is a project manager with the Jeff uh, UNDP in um, Uganda. So um, I think we have some slides to share as well for, for Peter, but uh, go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Hello. Uh... Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening for some people. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Achu, as uh, it's written there. I'm glad to be here uh, to share experience on what we did uh, together as a, a project, a contribution of the project on uh, that Uganda implemented. So uh, the story is that uh, we did a, a capacity needs assessment at the start of the project. And uh, one of the things that came out strongly was the, the need uh, to integrate agenda issues in all aspects of the project, uh, particularly looking at uh, things like uh, trainings, because uh, the project was a capacity uh, building project, so include gender issues in training, include gender issues in data collection, uh, captured storage, uh, include uh, gender issues uh, in uh, decision making, as well as uh, in the development of uh, work plans at uh, various levels. So unlike maybe uh, the presentation by Andrea, uh, mine uh, the nature of the project that supported uh, the production of the gender action plan uh, had uh, taken the real conventions approach, uh, which integrates the climate change, uh, combustion, and uh, I mean, uh, issues of climate change, issues of biodiversity, and issues of land degradation uh, combating. So, uh, Kindly go to the next slide. Oh, I share a slide from this side. I don't know which one is better. OK, fine. So uh, this is uh, what I was trying to talk about, that we had a capacity building project called Strengthening Institutional Capacity for Effective Implementation of Real Conventions in Uganda. 
and it was a, a global facility environment, uh, global environment facility funding project uh, through the UNDP. It was a, a four-year project which we did from 2017 to 2021. 20, uh, uh, so the approach here is that uh, there was integration uh, from the central government uh, stakeholders, uh, local government stakeholders. We had the stakeholders from academia. Also, we had stakeholders uh, from the CSOs, as you can uh, see there. So, uh, five uh, district local governments uh, were included uh, in this project, and then we had uh, also three CSOs, which were forming the core team uh, implementing the Rio Conventions, but also worked with uh, other ministries, departments, and agencies uh, like National Forest Authority, Minister of Finance, Minister of uh, uh, Mineral Development, Minister of Gender, and others. So for this particular assignment, uh, uh, like uh, Andrea stated, uh, most of us were a part of the project management unit, uh, did not have much uh, knowledge on it. Uh, so we had to utilize the knowledge of the Minister of Gender uh, who took part and we formed a team uh, uh, consisting of representatives from uh, uh, different uh, institutions and stakeholders that we engaged in the implementation uh, of the project. So uh, this team uh, uh, drafted the gender action plan and uh, the action plan uh, was then presented uh, to a bigger project uh, technical uh, team. Please go to the next slide. Tanya. Hello. Yes, Can I share yes. from this side? Yeah, um, okay. slide, I think, Peter? Yes. Yeah, uh, I have tried to mention about the project as I said earlier. Uh, that was a capacity building project uh, with the goal of strengthening industrial capacity uh, for your convention implementation and uh, environmental data information management in Uganda. And this all done to improve the reporting process to the Rio uh, conventions and ensure sustainable de development through better design and the enforcement of environmental policy. So that was the goal of the project. And then uh, in terms of objectives, the project uh, intended to strengthen the steel capacity for effective implementation of real conventions uh, in Uganda. Colleagues, as I stated earlier, uh, we looked at the three uh, interlinked uh, conventions, uh, but uh, Looking into the the components of the project, one was uh, to establish a national national framework for environment management uh, at national level, and then the second one was uh, to develop a uh, coordinated information and data uh, management systems. So all this required the integration of uh, gender issues, the issues of this uh, this disintegration. Uh, based on sex, uh, and then looking into what input uh, mm -hmm. each of uh, the different agendas uh, contribute in relation to the achievement of this uh, uh, components of, of the project. So uh, we came with the, the gender action plan. Please move to the gender action plan, please. Yeah, so the gender action plan had its objectives, uh, the main objective being promote equal opportunities and benefit, uh, benefits by men and women and other vulnerable groups in planning, aspects of planning and aspects of effective implementation of uh, Rio Conventions uh, in Uganda. So specifically, we wanted to look into to build and strengthen the capacity for gender mainstreaming by all sectors sectors, as you saw, that we had ministries, we had academia, we had CSOs, and other uh, participating sectors, as well as institutions implementing the real conventions, uh, with the particular emphasis on the common and complementary uh, priorities. 
as you know, each sector usually has got its own uh, priorities, but the issues of gender in Uganda are taken seriously, as you'll see later. So in every, in a priority, in every priority that you made, that was and it was necessary to uh, include issues of uh, gender. And then uh, the second one being promote equitable and meaningful engagement of women and men in decision making. I already alluded to this at national and subnational level, participating uh, decision making at uh, policy uh, development processes, uh, at, at planning uh, levels, as well as uh, issues of natural resource the governance. Issues of women are pertinent here because uh, the, the challenges of environment or natural resources affect women most, especially in developing countries. Uh, so their input in uh, developing strategies, developing work plans or policies are very pertinent uh, to that effect. So there was need to engage women at that level. And then the third one being to establish a mechanism. Once you have the strategies for decision making, so then there's need to have a mechanism to monitor the implementation of uh, the policies, the work plans, and as well as issues of governance relating to uh, gender, gender. So those commitments, we had to ensure that they are monitored. So the action plan also uh, considered that and took it as uh, one of the serious uh, aspects. Uh, next, please. Uh, so, uh, so what were the key elements to a successful development of the Gender Action Plan or this uh, so-called the Rio Convention's Agenda Action Plan, which is an integrated uh, uh, action plan handling the three Rio Conventions. We found that the enabling environment from government through enforcement of the gender certificate issue. As I stated earlier in Uganda, Issues of gender being cross-cutting and the government taking them uh, seriously. It's mandatory that any development that uh, takes root or that takes place has to uh, take into consideration aspects of gender. So the parliament, usually in terms of approving uh, sector work plans, has to ensure that uh, uh, gender issues are taken into consideration and there is a certificate uh, which is provided. So if you do not integrate uh, aspects of gender uh, in your work plans or in your budgets, uh, then uh, such may not be approved by the members of uh, parliament. And then two, that uh, coordination and cooperation in the implementation of the Rio Conventions and other multilateral environment agreements. Uh, uh, we established uh, uh, interministerial coordination uh, committee or cooperation committee uh, which uh, did quality assurance in respect to the first point in that uh, aspects of gender uh, have to be uh, had to be taken at, into consideration in every activity including the activities of uh, the Rio Conventions project but uh, something to note here is that uh, it is cost effective because uh, other than having a gender action plan for climate change and then maybe a gender action plan for land degradation or the certification management and a, a, a gender action plan for uh, CBD, uh, conventional biological diversity. Uh, this approach of coordination and cooperation, we found it uh, very cost effective and there is an aspect of sustainability as uh, different entities work together. And then there's utilization of synergy. And then uh, also what we found useful uh, was the, the use of existing structures. Ministries, departments and agencies have structures uh, from the minister to the lowest cadre, and then it just cascades down to the local governments. The local governments similarly have uh, their structures that cascade down up to the smallest unit at parish at the parish level. So uh, uh, this involvement of, and then involvement of other stakeholders uh, like the civil society, private sector and academia uh, made it uh, easy for us to 
not just to come up with the gender action plan, but also to track uh, its implementation during the period of the project and uh, beyond, which uh, is an aspect of uh, sustainability. And then uh, an aspect of goodwill and general willingness, because as I stated earlier, that uh, we recognize uh, aspects of gender, especially contribution of women. So there is generally goodwill at local community level, at the national level, at the parliament level, and every institution. So uh, this uh, helped us to develop and accept, uh, to reach out to different uh, uh, stakeholders who readily accepted the idea of coming up with a gender action plan. And then uh, also utilize the use of expertise or experts within the project, other than maybe hiring a consultant. As I stated earlier, the Minister of Gender was given the task uh, to deliver. So the, it had to kick out other experts from within the different stakeholders, like Minister of Agriculture, Minister of Environment, National Environment Authority, National uh, Forest Authority, and others to be incorporated in the team that uh, came up with, uh, uh, with the gender action plan. So we found this cheap and as, uh, as opposed to the use of uh, consultants who are kind of expensive, and then also uh, helping in terms of continuity uh, after the project has closed. And then uh, we established the committees. Uh, the committees are, uh, are playing a role uh, in terms of, uh, as I stated, the Committee on Development of the Gender Action Plan. But in addition to these committees, we had uh, technical teams with different specializations uh, contributing to the development of the Gender Action Plan. And uh, in addition to the Gender Action Plan, we have come up with a memorandum of understanding with the different institutions uh, committing one to uh, continue with the implementation of the uh, Gender Action Plan uh, once the project has closed, but also committing to ensure that issues of gender are integrated into uh, their work plans and, uh, uh, and, and budgets. And then uh, lastly, the multi-institutional uh, involvement, as uh, I, in the introduction, talked about government and non-government uh, institutions, uh, working together, uh, delivering the real conventions, uh, sharing responsibilities and the, for, for the common good. So um, different institutions, be it private sector, be it the CSOs, be it the local governments, uh, the academia and uh, the central government coming together and working together to ensure that the issues of gender, which is one of the cross-cutting issues, are uh, embedded in all their actions uh, relating to the uh, implementation of uh, Rio conventions at, 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 at the, in their respective institutions. Uh, next. Yes, what are some of the lessons that we've learned uh, which can be uh, taken? Uh, in the post 2020 global biodiversity uh, framework. Uh, we have uh, five uh, lessons that we found very important. One is the use of uh, the multi-stakeholder engagement promotes synergy, as uh, you heard me explain, that uh, having different stakeholders. Imagine if we did have, for example, the gender, Minister of Gender to be part of the project team, perhaps it would have been a bit hard for us to come up with the gender action plan. And then uh, we also considered other ministries such that we formed a, an interministerial coordination uh, team, uh, which uh, helped to keep the team together. Actually, uh, some of these have continued uh, through the MOUs, as I stated earlier. They have been become part of the working uh, instrument utilized uh, by the different institutions that contribute to the real conventions. So they are still functional and operational. And the MOUs, they have cited out what they can do uh, in this period in terms of implementing the gender action plan. So this is better than working individually. And then uh, synergistic implementation of gender issues across institutions or individuals was uh, promoted because gender is a cross-cutting issue. And as I stated, also the issues of gender, gender in terms of women uh, participation, they are the drivers of change, 
uh, in Uganda, like in other parts of the world. And then in terms of uh, challenges of environment or the real conventions at the local level, also they, they, they become victims. But in terms of uh, restoring degraded landscapes, again, women are very, very uh, useful. They play a key role in this. So uh, besides that, you find that the real conventions are the three in terms of uh, climate change, biodiversity, and uh, uh, land degradation. These are you can't separate. An intervention in one enhances uh, the others, and it's very vital for human development and survival. And then working through partnerships, the MOUs, uh, which I, I have talked about before, was very useful in terms of coming up with a gender action plan and can be replicated in other uh, projects, in other uh, developments in future. And then uh, the building of technical capacity. Actually, from this uh, gender action plan development, the capacity of many of us technocrats in Uganda can now able to participate in terms of uh, identifying gender issues and then ensuring that these are included uh, in their development agenda. So this uh, helps to promote sustainability. And the last one here being joint implementation uh, enables is identification and filling of any capacity gaps. Like you saw the Minister of uh, Gender yeah, giving us support. Otherwise, it would have maybe been hard for us to to, to come up with this gender action plan, we would have uh, rushed to hire a consultant uh, for, to solve this problem. But the, they are there, and then now there's a uh, network, and the, there's follow-up on how this uh, can be uh, taken forward. I think I'll end here. Uh, I see we don't have much time. The rest of uh, what I had was uh, pictures showing the contributions, as you can see there. See women, actually, you see the ladies uh, kneeling down there. One of them is a very high profile person in the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda. And then the other is also a senior person. So you see them taking serious, uh, seriously participating. So it's not just talking, uh, maybe uh, from stories I, I brought in these pictures for people to appreciate uh, the involvement of uh, different stakeholders and then the uh, dialogues that we had. And this is where the ideas of coming up there with the agenda action plan uh, was uh, originated. And uh, many other pictures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Thank you so much. Peter. Peter. Um, um, I just have to ask you to, I think, turn off your. Yeah, sorry, just to prevent the echo there. Um, thanks very much for that. Uh, I, I know we're, we're very short on time. I would just like to take an extra few minutes, if I may, of your time. I know we have at least um, one question in the chat, and I was hoping to give the opportunity to um, uh, another participant to, to raise a, a few comments as well. Um, just on, on the question that has been raised, um, thank you very much for, for this. Uh, regarding the sources of funding that can be tapped into for projects that uplift women. I think what we are trying to um, illustrate in the in the publication is that there are increasingly uh, more financing options available through things such as the climate um, uh, the gender, um, uh, sorry, the, the Green Climate Fund and uh, the Global Environment Facility and, and other such um, financing mechanisms that have specific requirements for, for gender responsive approaches. And um, also the point that is, is um, emphasized uh, through the example shared in this publication is that um, doing, uh, uh, taking a gender responsive approach to, to biodiversity can yield um, better benefits or stronger benefits that that uh, support multiple sustainable development goals um, and including climate as well as biodiversity as well as gender. So um, with that rationale in mind, that can be put forward as part of a, a funding proposal um, for to, through regular funding streams. Um, but I would like to just quickly invite um, Shoma um, Chakrabarti, if you're still online with us. Um, Shoma was our consultant um, who was um, uh, diligently researching the um, the different case studies uh, that we received and, and putting together this 
this document. So I would I would just invite you to share some some thoughts on this. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, well, thanks everybody. What a, a roundup. I don't want to speak at people. Um, so I was very excited because uh, at uh, the chance to do this because I work on projects and policy and programming on the ground, um, often with their own based agencies, but not only. And, um, you know, every time I was trying to convince people to invest uh, because, uh, you know, in, in gender and social inclusion, the examples was from years back and it was they would just look at me like, <laughs> no, <laughs> this is not helpful. So it was a really, I think, good move to do this where it's more linked to SDGs and things like this, which are compulsory, you know, for governments. So the more, I think that's what I would really say, in my experience and what I hope this publication will do, is to link as much as possible to um, the sort of compulsory government processes. So SDGs, so we're talking about, I can't remember which target now, 5A, you know, uh, on land. I mean, that's sort of cross cutting, you know, uh, across everything. So that is something that I wanted to share. I guess I was just reflecting also on the fact that maybe the real target audience is actually not here with us today because, you know, it's, we are all here because we think gender is important. So I guess my question is, how do we reach out to, to others who have yet to be convinced or who maybe think, yeah, no, we see that it's important, but it's really about participation, isn't it? You know, so how do we reach out to them? And, and actually it's, um, I, I know that I, I hope that part of the value of these short, you know, examples is to allow people working uh, in the field to do quick elevator pitches because, you know, busy people who hold budget lines, they often don't, do they, have a lot of time. So um, it's the very concise um, nature of these that uh, um, I think will be useful. I guess also stepping back and maybe just to share something from my experience, we talked about funding. It does matter, doesn't it? You know, we, we have great ideas and then what happens? I guess what I'd like to say is, is just corroborate what uh, Tanya and others were saying is that um, at the end of the day, a lot of the funding, I mean, there is more climate finance than anything else, right? And uh, uh, a lot of it is an adaptation. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to say is there are so many synergies, there are so many synergies um, that it would really make sense to me to try and see, you know, when we're working on a land degradation project or when we're working on a, um, a, a climate change adaptation or mitigation project, you know, what what are the biodiversity and gender? Because there are many, many, many parallels. You know, I'm looking at some of the participants. I mean, you're all much more expert than I am, you know. Um, climate mitigation, you've got forests, you've got, I mean, you know, uh, I think people here have all of that expertise. But I do have to say that it's often in climate type, uh, climate finance projects that I often find that there is not just the theoretical scope to do a, a beautiful gender action plan, but actually to, you know, to find some money um, to do this. I wanted to just finally say I love the private sector examples. I thought they were so valuable because everyone's talking about the private sector. You know, the public sector can only finance so much. And there are some. And I think this is this is an interesting one to watch. And um, um, I think I think those are really my thoughts. I guess I would like to know from from the participants. You know, we've gone over time, but in another life, you know, I would be very interested to know from participants how, you know, what they think they can do with it. What do they think of the challenges? Uh, what next? Do we need French and Spanish versions? You know what? What is it? Um, what next? Thank you so much. Thank you, Shama. Thanks for um, 
Thanks for your thoughts and thanks also again for all of your hard work in putting this together. It was not a small effort, um, but I hope, uh, as you mentioned, that it it will be of, of value uh, for for all of those um, working in this area, even those that are new to working on gender or new to gender mainstreaming, um, that this can be something that you can pick up and look for examples in, in your part of the world and elsewhere to see oh, how things have been done and um, what the options are um, that might be available for, for your own, um, uh, achieving your own objectives. So just to also, um, pick up on what uh, Shoma was saying there, what what comes next? This uh, publication is is launched as a tool uh, to to really aid thinking and planning and and sort of guide the rationale and the um, the um, the uh, I guess the efforts to um, uh, engage or support those um, who who may not be so involved in, in gender to to pick up these um, pick up uh, uh, types of approaches that can support um, multiple benefits in in your biodiversity programming and policy um, very much in support of the post 2020 framework implementation and the new gender plan of action implementation under the CBD as well as under um, the different Rio conventions. So I, I invite you again to to take a look to um, you know come back to us if you have any comments or thoughts, but uh, I, I very much appreciate all of your time with us today and apologies that we have gone over a little bit, but uh, I thank you again and I um, hope you all have a very nice International Women's Day. Thank you. very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Peter.